I'm going to do an audio sync by clapping my hands. And we're rolling. This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Jerry Green on February 26, 2020 at 10.30 a.m. We are located at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we begin, could you please state and spell your first and last names for the transcriber? Gerald, G-E-R-A-L-D, Green, G-R-E-E-N. Thank you. Before we talk about your time in Vietnam, I'd like to get some biographic information. When and where were you born? Omaha, Nebraska, uh, April 46. Who were your family members? Uh, my mother, uh, my aunt and uncle, uh, cousins. Just, uh, I had no, I had no father. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a sperm donor, and. Uh, Uh, and I had a large, I had a large extended family, aunts and uncles. Yeah. Uh, my mother had three more children uh, after she re she married and had three more children. So I have the uh, two, half two, 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 two half brothers and half sister. Now, did you grow up in Omaha or did you move around? Where do I, you consider your hometown? Omaha. Omaha. Yeah. Uh, how'd you come to enter the military and when? It was something I was always going to do. It was just, it, it was a given, uh, seeing my family history and the fact that the draft was in, you know, everybody was going. What year? 63. 63. Yeah. Uh, I enlisted the day after my 17th birthday. Uh, now. Vietnam wasn't on anybody's radar much in 1963. Never heard of it. Uh, where did the Navy send you for boot camp? San Diego. San Diego. West Coast Hollywood Marine, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and after basic, were were you able to choose your own rate, your own specialty? Yes, I was. Uh, and you uh, chose aviation. Uh, aviation I was, was mechanic. An avi aviation structure mechanic. Structural mechanic. And I went to school. They sent me to school in Me Memphis, Tennessee. How long a school? Eight, uh, Sixteen, eighteen weeks. Uh, a pretty good slug of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, d did you become a, an air crewman? Yes. After uh, after I left school, I had orders to uh, a transport squadron in Japan, and uh, we had small cargo planes that flew to the ships. And after you know, after. A, a year or so I started as a, as a crewman. Those cod planes? Yes, sir, or the yeah, cods. flown on them. Uh, describe that aircraft for, for our... Uh, twin engine. Uh, I think it held nine, nine or 11 passengers or 3,000 pounds of cargo and uh, Two precipitating engines and a lot of hydraulic nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> now, what was your as the an air crewman? What were you doing? You the loadmaster or loadmaster, they, mechanic, engineer? Everything. They called us plane captains. Mm. Okay, and we we loaded the plane, unloaded the plane, fuel, oil, uh, maintained. Uh, if something went wrong, we had to. So you had to kind of cross train in a lot of different areas, yeah. and uh, uh, we took, you know, got the coffee, got the water, uh, figured up the loads, and, and flew with the airplane everywhere it went. Everywhere it went. Everywhere. So you were you were flying out of what base in Japan? 
uh, Naval Air Station in Adsugi was our home base, uh, and we covered the whole the whole Western Pacific. We'd fly out of Atsugi, uh out of Iwakuni, the Marine Corps Air Station on the southern uh, southern portion of Japan, uh, Okinawa, Taipei, Hong Kong, uh, the Philippines. But once Vietnam got going, the whole squadron basically deployed to. Uh, QB Point Air Station in the in the Philippines, at Sub, adjacent to Subic Bay. Yeah, and you're working the carriers off of Vietnam. Yeah, working the carriers from the Philippines. They the scuttlebutt was they didn't want us to go into Da Nang or Cameron Bay because we had the only airplanes capable of doing what we were doing, didn't and if we put them at risk. didn't want to put them in harm's way. So instead of having a short 30 or 45 minute flight from the from a land base to the ships we were going four to four to six hours depending on where the ships were just to get there just to get that was one way yeah now would you stay overnight on the carrier or not nor normally no home? turn around come home I, he handed me a note c1 trader c1a's that that's what the aircraft that's the aircraft, the aircraft yeah Later, they were replaced by the... We just called them CODs. Yeah. Yeah. Squadron. VR-21, which later became VRC-50, mm. which I'm a charter member or plank owner. <laughs> plank holder. And, uh, yeah, they were later replaced by uh, the C-2 Greyhound, the one that you see on... Uh, TV on it was there's a show about the uh, legal beagles in the oh the CSIS shows yeah sometimes that and there was one before that that had I don't watch much TV but there was another show about uh, Navy lawyers uh, I can't remember Jags that. Jags that's it uh, so that's why everybody knows what a cod is now. Before that show, you said cod. They thought you were crazy. Thought you were talking about dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you often shuttle into Vietnam, either Da Nang or yeah, uh, Cameron uh, frequent, or somewhere? Frequently, Da Nang, Da Trang, Chu Lai, Cameron, Tonsonut. Uh, were the main places, but just in and pick up a load and go. Yeah, it went fuel. When the uh, when the ships were way up north on Yankee Station, off the coast of North Vietnam, we didn't have the fuel to make it from Cuby. No, that's a long ride. Yeah. I made that ride. So up. we'd have to go uh, from Cuby into Nha Trang or Da Nang or Chu Lai usually because they were further north. Da Nang was the you know the fuel stop of choice, and uh, then go on to the ship and do the same thing on the way back. Yeah. So that made a, a long day even longer. That's right. Now, so you you your mission switched to Vietnam pretty much, and you moved out of. Japan to Philippines? Yeah, we were still technically based in Japan, and we rotated. Uh, the single guys usually got longer longer deployments to uh, to the QB than you know the married guys, and they rotated pilots, but uh, a lot of us stayed in QB almost full time. Yeah. You but were we're, single still? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you had to rotate back to Japan, uh, I can't remember, every 60 days, so you could still get your temporary duty pay. Uh, what were living conditions like? Living conditions. 
At first, they were terrible. We had a Quonset hut that was assigned to our squadron on the flight line. And uh, that's where we worked out of and slept out of. There was a barracks uh, that we were assigned to, assigned bunks in the barracks, but we we just put the bunks in the, in the line shack and slept there most of the time because we were on duty so much. Yeah. Could you describe your friendships with and your impressions of, of the sailors that you worked with and worked for? 99% of them were just straight up guys that would do anything in the world for you. And, and uh, you, you just, you created a bond. We flew singly. Yeah, you know, there's only one, one enlisted guy on a crew. Uh, and so you didn't get that, that bonding, you know, and of course pilots were officers and the Navy's always been really, uh, there's a line yeah. between officer and enlisted. Standoffish. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, some of the other services from talking to other, other vets, some of the other services like the army, uh, they didn't have that line. That line wasn't so distinct. Uh, and, uh, but in the Navy, especially with pilots, because, uh, well, quite frankly, pilots are a bunch of arrogant bastards. Uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, and your ship captain is God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, now we had some really, really good officers, some really nice people. Uh, but there was still that, uh, Reserve, that line. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh. I got got in with one crew, uh, and we had an unexpected RO in in Saigon. We had to re remain overnight. Yeah. And uh, all I had, I had my flight suit. That was it. No wallet. No uh, dog tags. That was it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, the aircraft commander was Lieutenant Commander Bell, and the uh, he just made Lieutenant Commander. And the, the co-pilot was a, a guy named, uh, he was a Lieutenant J.G. named uh, Mooberry. We called him Mr. Moo. And uh, we went downtown, downtown to Saigon for, for, uh, to stay. And he said, I don't, we're not going to split up because they had officers' quarters and enlisted quarters. And he pulled out a set of railroad tracks and put them on my flight suit and said, you're now... Uh, you're now Lieutenant Green because we, we, if we have to get out of town in a hurry, we don't want to have to stop and look around, we'll see look where around you are. Find you. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, uh, I just gave Mr. Moo the bags and said, "I'm outranking you. You carry this stuff." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, things like that. And then we went out and, and, and I didn't have I didn't have any money. I didn't have two knuckles to rub together, and uh, went out on the town, had a few drinks, and. You know, they paid for everything. Uh -huh. But that was the exception. Yeah. Uh, How much time did you have for yourself when you were back at, back at Cubic Point? Uh, what did you do for recreation, off-duty time? Drink. Or did you have any? This went through several phases. Uh, when the North Vietnamese attacked PT boats in uh, August of 64, the whole squadron just overnight, we were gone and we were in Cuby. Things kind of calmed down after a couple of weeks and they sent most air, we you know, kind of went back. And we always had one, one or two airplanes on the road somewhere. Uh, but during that initial uh, between the attacks on the PT boats and the time that, that things got real hot and heavy in, in uh, March of 65, we'd have three airplanes in, uh, in QB. And each airplane had, well, they'd send three enlisted guys, uh, a structural mechanic, an mecha engine mechanic, and either a, an electrician or an avionics person. Uh, so you had nine guys down there. And every 
every plane flew every day, but they only took one guy with them. Mm. So uh, it was kind of like McHale's Navy. Uh, we launched the load airplane, launched them in the morning, and the guys that weren't uh, uh, weren't flying had nothing to do. So we'd go down, we'd take our our ground equipment and drive down to the beach and uh, sit there. There's there's only one way into if you're familiar with Subic Bay. There's only one way in by air. That's through the you know through the gap in the mountains and. Uh, we sit down there at the beach and swim, sunbathe, maybe drink a few beers and until we saw the airplanes coming back. And then we'd hustle back up to <laughs> do whatever. Sounds it, like tough duty. It was. Uh, and then, of course, when, uh, when it all hit the fan in early 65, uh, we had eight or ten airplanes down there. And we went on 24 on, 24 off. And... Uh, the 24 on were, were, it was always, you were always awake. I mean, you were always doing something. If you were flying, you'd get on the airplane, you know, you'd fly the mission, come back probably at eight or nine o'clock at night and have to uh, maintain the airplanes, you know, because they were all, they were always broken. There's something always wrong. So you had to work on the airplanes and to get them fueled and oiled and you know, pre-flight and ready to go for the next day. Uh, and then you get off at 7 o'clock in the morning and uh, hit 24 hours off. Now, your overseas deployment on this stuff ran from to which years? I left the States in December of 63, and I re returned back to the States in December 68. 63 to 68, yeah. five-year overseas deployment. Yes, sir. I asked for two of those. You years. asked it for it. Yeah. 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 Now, I did go back to Hawaii for uh, a couple of weeks for a... Uh, Vacation R&R? &R? Uh, no. Survival school. Oh. That ain't no vacation. No, it, it wasn't. It <laughs> was not a vacation. Now, toward the latter part of your tour, there's a lot of social tension, anti-war protests, race riots back home. Does any of that come out to where you are? No. Uh, we didn't hear about it. Well, we you, know, you heard about it, but it was something that happened on another planet. Yeah. You know, it... it uh, it didn't affect us. I saw very little uh, racial tension where, you know, in, in the squadron I was in, in the, the places I served, I saw very little. Uh, it, we would go out. Uh, you been to Alangapo? Have you been to Alangapo in the town outside of Subic Bay? There's a main drag and then it forks. Anybody's allowed on the main drag. Uh, and we'd go out as a, as a group, you know, uh, black, white, uh, Filipinos, Chinese, Mexican, wh whatever. We would all go and have a couple of beers. And then all the black guys had to go left, and we had to go right. Uh, this that, was the Filipinos? Yeah, way yeah. Way of dividing things yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or tradition. I don't know how it got started, or that's the way it was when we got there. And uh, they had their clubs. You had yours. Yeah, yeah. Now we had, like I said, we we were real close. We were all real close. We had, uh, of course, we had black black guys and black men. And uh, we went. One of them says, "Come on down here to this bar with me," you know, and. I guess there was four or five of us walked in there, and uh, we got a lot of looks, a lot of stares. And he just said, hey, it's okay, it's cool. And we had a couple beers and went back to our side of town. <laughs> uh, but that was acceptable. I mean, there was no... Uh, 
there was no animosity among, right. you know, or tension among black and white or uh, Asian or anybody else. Can you describe the quality of the leadership in, in your outfit as high up as you could see it? That's a tough question. Uh, they were, uh, I just have to say most of the time, they were they were kind of looking out to advance their ranks. There, I mean, it, they, they were they were looking out to advance themselves uh, higher self up. Self-interest. Uh, yeah, self-interest. Uh, and like I say, that there's there's this this line between officer and enlisted, and uh, uh, they just kind of let you know that that's you know they they gave the orders and you followed the orders. Uh, now on flight crew it was totally different, but uh, uh, the, the administration and, and those kinds of things was, you know, kind of the real desk founders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, the squadron skipper was uh, definitely looking out for his own self-interest. Uh, he. You know, all he wanted was a, he was a full commander. He wanted that other stripe, and uh, he eventually got it, and uh, made it to captain. Yeah, and he didn't care what he had to do to get it, or how many how many people he had to he had to step on. You know, uh, I guess it was kind of like people talked about uh, George Patton. You know. Our blood in his guts, kind, yeah, right. kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> Talk about your most vivid memories of that long deployment. Describe the worst day you had during that whole thing. I really didn't have, I guess the worst day and the, and the best day were kind of the same thing. Uh, we went out to the, uh, to the Midway, USS Midway, and they told us to rig for, for a medevac. There's a sailor need to get into the hospital at Clark, the Air Force Base in the Philippines. And he uh, had driven, I can't remember what the, elevator that's in the center of the flight deck forward, I don't know, I think it's number three. When an elevator goes down to take an airplane to the hangar deck, there's supposed to be these lifelines that come up from the deck. Keep to, you from yeah, walking yeah, in the yeah, just, yeah, that's why they call called lifelines. The story I heard is lifelines didn't come up, and he's driving a tug down the flight deck at night, no lights, you know, could be Blackout could off the coast of North Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so he drives the he tug drove the tug right, right off, and uh, lost a leg, and uh, he was near death for a while, uh, several days. And they said, let's take him. You know, he's good. He's well enough to go to the hospital. So we're going to take him into uh, Clark, and. Uh, uh, they sent a doctor and a corpsman. You know, usually medevac to send a corpsman, but this one they sent a doctor because uh, this kid was in pretty bad shape and he lost a lot of blood. Uh, and uh, in fact, when I got back to QB, uh, I took the deck plates up, uh, the big sections of the floor of the airplane, took those up and drilled holes in the uh, skin to let the, the blood and the body fluids drain out. Whoa. Uh, yeah. So that was probably the only decent thing I did, uh, you know, helping somebody medevac. It, you know, you're, you're kind of like an angel, I guess, uh, kind of like the dust off guys. 
uh, uh, and it made me feel good. And uh, but that's that's a memory that that's you know, I'll never forget that kid. You know, he just had a brand new baby, never saw, and uh, in fact, he never. I didn't know if he made it or not, and finally, in the in the mid '80s, uh, I decided it was time to to look for him. It took about six months, but I did find him. You found. I did find him, and I did meet him, and I met the little girl that uh, was born while he was while he was deployed. Yeah. Describe a catapult launch of a cod with a patient like this aboard. What are your considerations? How do you configure the aircraft? Uh, I'm sure, almost 100% sure we did a deck launch. No catapult involved. No catapult. No, no, because we, if we were light and they cleared the deck and put us, they'd put us back all the way on a fan tail. On the angle deck. Like a normal takeoff. Just a normal. And you would do that over a catapult launch yeah. for the consideration of that. Yeah, that and patient. of course they, they had him in, in one of those metal, <coughs> uh, some sort of litter with, you know, the, the wire mesh kind of thing. Yeah. And we strapped it down real good. And uh, uh, so it was just, you know, normal a normal deck launch. We did that uh, on rare occasions. Uh, yeah. We do that because that catapult launch is a real kick in the butt. It it absolutely <laughs> is. Uh, uh, I got my first cat launch off the Yorktown, which has had hydraulic cats, and there's nothing you, you can't describe it. It's no. just uh, <laughs> the landing's pretty good too. Yeah. Well, my. So, my my first mission was uh, to the Ranger, you know, and we landed on the Ranger. You know, it was it was kind of tight, but you know, it's not bad. Uh, and then we deck, deck launched off of it, uh, off the Ranger. The next day or the next time I went out, it was to the Yorktown, and the Yorktown is about I don't have to say I don't know, but it's they and they had some really tight wires and. It was the landing was an experience like uh, you never. <laughs> and the cat shot, you know, you're sitting, the crewman's sitting backwards, and uh, when we got so your passengers aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody's sitting backwards except the the pilot and co-pilot. So uh, uh, then we had after after the the cat shot, you have a little brown ring around your neck. Your asshole. <laughs> How much contact did you have with your family back home, if any? Letters. Letters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, letters. That's it. Yeah. How much news did you get where you were? Stars and Stripes, Armed Forces Radio? Uh, Stars and Stripes uh, was about it. Mm. Uh, How did that news about what was happening back home affect you and the guys around you, or did it? It didn't. I didn't pay any attention to it. If it didn't, you know, uh, you had enough to worry about without worrying about what was going on in the states. Now, when when the racial stuff really got hot and heavy, you know, like in '65, '64, '65, must have been '65. Uh, we had a couple guys, a couple of black guys. Well, I ain't putting up that crap. I get back there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a 45, and we're gonna, you know, let's calm down, you know. Uh, and uh, but it didn't impact me or the people close around me. Yeah. Uh,
Now, did you ha have a fair amount of contact with the Filipino population around Subic Bay? Yeah, in, in the bars. Uh, that was about it. We, that was about it? Yeah. Yeah. Any pro or anti-war demonstrations around there? I wouldn't think so. Mm -mm. No. No, they were just... They uh, smelled money. They, they were glad to have us. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know that they were happy about the war. But they were happy that so many sailors was pulling into Subic Bay. Yeah. Uh, and that, on the other hand, now, uh, whenever you go back up to Adsugi, the uh, the locals in the bars up there weren't uh, weren't faring very well because uh, the whole we had a whole Marine Air Wing uh, on one side of the base up there, uh, and in '65. Shipped ABC. them all to Da Nang. Yeah, yeah. They, went, they all left to Da Nang in uh, the little town that was outside the, the their entrance to the base just virtually dried up. Yeah. Uh, A lot of mama sons unhappy. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We come to 1968, and your deployment's up. You're going home. Uh, what was that like? What did you fly home? Where did you land? Well, I landed in Travis. At Travis, uh, bust over to uh, San Francisco. San Francisco, and uh, uh, I had a couple hippies look at me kind of funny, and. Uh, Think better of it. I guess. I, I mean, I. They didn't uh, say nothing. No, they didn't say anything. They just gave me a kind of a, a dirty look, and I guess I must give them a dirty look back because, you know, uh, they didn't say anything, and mm. uh, I was a rather violent person at the time, <laughs> and uh, uh, I just soon whipped her ass as to not, you know. Yeah. Uh, so. Had no had no problems there. Now was that you done with the Navy enlistment, or are you going to stay for a career? Well, I stayed seven years. When I got back from from overseas, I went to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Cecil Field. They sent me to a training squadron. Uh, the A seven had just come on the line, and we were training pilots. You know, pilots and maintenance people on uh, on the A7. So uh, I did that for about a year and decided a uh, year and a half maybe and decided to get out. Had enough. Had enough. Did you have any trouble or difficulty readjusting to civilian life after seven years in the Navy? Not really, because I went right uh, from the Navy, I went to the airline industry, and everybody there was veterans. We were veterans, everybody, yeah. 90, 95%. Uh, and it was the same, the same kind of environment, uh, if you will. The, the uh, things had to be done on time, uh, you know, launching, you know, Dispatch an airplane. Book. Yeah, by the book, on time. Uh, and so it was just, that part was just kind of a continuation of the military uh, with a lot more money and a lot more benefits. <laughs> so, uh, no, I didn't have a, uh, a hard time adjusting to the careers or the, uh, that, you know, until, until I retired. Yeah. And got away from that and have to deal with all these civilians now. Yeah. Uh, and they drive me crazy. <laughs> uh, have you kept in touch with guys you flew with, any of them? Yeah. Uh, we had, uh, I guess there's maybe a dozen, a dozen and a half of us uh, 
get together. Uh, I've only been to one reunion because of scheduling conflicts, uh, but uh, we kind of stay in touch. And uh, but the guys that I were really close to, I hadn't been able to find. Uh, so uh, it, it's I worked with these guys, but we weren't really close. We didn't, you know, we didn't hit town together. We didn't, you know, uh, we didn't do a lot of stuff together. Yeah. Uh, so. But yeah, we still stay in touch and, and uh, keep up with each other, and and of course they're they're all getting old and dying off now, so it's uh, it's a little harder. Did your overseas deployment change you? Affect your life afterward for good or for less good? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, certainly it changed you. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you you come back home and, and the people uh, that you you know that that you hung out with, the people that you knew, uh, they don't know you anymore. And when you come back home, it's not home anymore. It's not. It's this 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 place you grow up. You know, I I grew up here. You know, and I remember going over here and I remember going over there. But there's no there's only memories. There's nothing in the present. Uh, even when I first went back, you know, in 68. Uh, and everything's smaller than you remember. Yeah. 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 And, uh, uh, and everything, everything changed, but it stayed the same. You know, I mean, some of these old buildings are still as dilapidated now as they were uh, in in sixty three when I when I enlisted, uh, so uh, how do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today, or is it? I don't think it is in society in general. There's a small a small portion of the population uh, that they know uh, that it wasn't it wasn't our fault, you know. It wasn't we weren't the bad guys, and we got treated like crap when we got home. And uh, they're sorry for it, but uh, the general population, uh, especially the young people, that's. That's ancient history, you know. That's like the Civil War or something, uh, and has no interest to them at all. Yeah. Uh, if if people have had relatives, you know, their grandpa or, or somebody that that is a veteran, uh, they have a little more curiosity, and a little more compassion, and a little more uh, interest in what was going on. Uh, what was your rank when you separated from the Navy? I was first class petty officer, E6. Uh, have you vis have, is there anything I haven't asked you about you'd like to talk about before we close up here? Uh, The what the way, uh, the way we were treated and the way the government treat treated us, and still is, you know, uh, they just recently uh, approved clear water or uh, blue water sailors for uh, some benefits from Agent Orange. Yeah. You know, I mean, and uh, they're just waiting for us to die off before they, you know, hey, these guys are fixed to die. Let's give them some benefits. Uh, the way the POWs were treated, the MIAs, uh, the uh, the country in general, and the uh, government in particular just really d don't care. Uh, I do think uh, a really positive thing that came out of it was the recognition that the troops are getting today. I think if, if we had not been treated the way we were treated, uh, I think that that caused an awareness, 
you know, a generation later, you know, hey, look how bad these guys were treated. We can't let that happen again. Uh, and uh, uh, so, when, when you know when the troops come home from deployment now, they're they're greeted. They're you know they're they're welcomed. They're appreciated. Uh, I've been in airports where offloading a bunch of troops, people stand up and clap, you know? Uh, and I, I, I feel like that, that what we went through is at least partially responsible for that. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a lot of bitterness about the way we were, were maybe not treated, but ignored. You know, like your little bastard stepchildren, uh, uh, the guys I worked with at, in, the, in the airline business. You know, like I said, we most of us were veterans, but we didn't talk about it, especially mm -hmm. in front of other people. Mm -hmm. It was it was like being like being queer and hiding in the closet. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't till for me it wasn't until around the early two thousands. Uh, you know, maybe after 9-11, patriotism, you know, became more popular, and we came out of the closet. You know, we started wearing bumper stickers and hats and, you know, things like that, and became more acceptable. Uh, it was it was acceptable to uh, acknowledge the fact that you were a Vietnam veteran. And uh, have you visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial? In yes, DC? I am. What yeah. are your thoughts when you go there? Oh, sadness and anger, and and I'm I'm trying to quell that anger, but uh, and the 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 political aspects of the war really make me mad, you know, because if they didn't let us win, they didn't let us fight the way we could have and should have. Uh, and they didn't learn a damn thing. Not a damn thing. They're doing the same thing with these doing kids the today. Thing. They're putting them in a in a meat grinder, and there you go. And, and nine, ten combat deployments. Yeah, for, yeah. For, uh, and these fit. the The names on the wall are are people don't realize that these are actual, really, real people. You know, these were kids, eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old. Uh, and, and they're going forever, and it's not just not just that fifty-eight thousand plus. It's their mothers and their fathers and their sisters and brothers and husbands and wives. People in America have a direct connection to a name on that wall. Yeah, classmate, uh, brother, sister, father, uh, mother. And and it, it's. It was really for nothing. I mean, not taken away from anything from the people that participated, from the veterans, because everybody went over there and did did the best they could with what they had. Fought and they for were each other because they, yeah. there was no other reason. Yeah, well, there's, yeah. Uh, and the, the, the uselessness of it, uh, that these guys all died, and many, many more were, were injured and crippled and all all the tragedy that it brought on for not a damn thing we didn't accomplish shit uh and and uh it just it makes me angry it makes me mad as hell uh but still the, the those guys are they did what they were supposed to do their duty honor and country and uh now you've heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War commemoration. Yeah. What do you think of that? Well, I don't know. What, uh, I think it's a good thing, but I don't try to figure out. Uh, I went to something a couple years ago that was the 50th anniversary commemoration. It's running for 10 years, just like the war did. Well, that was my question. When does, <laughs> When is the anniversary? Uh, well, it's it's... When did you serve in Vietnam? Everybody served different tours, yeah. so well, it stretches from a ten-year period. Yeah, from six what? We're going until twenty twenty-five is when we're going to close. So the it doors. goes 
like 65 to 75. Yeah. Okay. And we're doing See, it. Okay. For me, the war started August 2nd, 1964. Yeah. When they attacked the, the PT boats, attacked those 10 cans up in the Gulf. We wow. consider a Vietnam veteran anybody that served from 1955 to 1975. Yeah. 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 But, uh, uh, Have you gotten your Vietnam veteran lapel pin? No. No? Well, we better fix that. We, uh, you know, when my dad and my, all my uncles came back from World War II, yeah. they wore what they called the ruptured duck, yeah. which was yeah. a discharge pen, a flying yeah. eagle with a white enamel circle around uh -huh. it. And uh, the, uh, we thought the Vietnam veterans ought to have something like that, so we made one. A ruptured duck? Yeah, a ruptured duck. And on the back, it's engraved, a grateful nation thanks and honors you. So well, I'll pin this on your... Go ahead and stand up. I'll put it right there. How's that? That's great. Got a nice eagle. And, uh, let me see if I got it right. Yeah. There we go. Thank you for coming Thank you. in. Thank you. And uh, I didn't realize who you were when you came out there to get me. And it's an honor, a, an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to meet you. Well, and, my pleasure, my honor. Thank yeah. you for coming yeah, in. Yeah. Thank you for everything you're doing. Oh. Uh, and uh, 